I think it's a really basic point of curiosity in the world and people that come to MIT who are very passionate and want to change the world should know how airplanes fly, some, some information about aviation and this incredible feat of, of humankind to be able to fly through the air. Today on the podcast, we're talking flight, specifically how a course has been designed and refined to allow hundreds of students to pursue a path toward flying. I thought that it was really important that any student that's interested in this uh, have the opportunity to learn about airplanes and learn how to become a pilot themselves. Welcome to Chalk Radio, a podcast about inspired teaching at MIT. I'm your host, Sarah Hansen, from MIT OpenCourseWare. In this episode, we'll be talking about MIT's flight school with two of its instructors, Philip Greenspan and Tina Srivastava. In our conversation, they share how a number of innovations have made the course incredibly popular both in and outside of the MIT community. Part of why we want to highlight this class is that its evolution has allowed for a nimbleness of structure without sacrificing the effectiveness of its instruction. It's truly fascinating that something as seemingly technical as flight school can take so many different shapes. I wanted to dig into how it's possible to find flexibility in instruction with such high risks, and also what made this course so successful at attracting and preparing future pilots. We'll pick up our conversation with Philip and Tina explaining what it means to have access to flight school and what it really takes to take flight. People have been wanting to fly for uh, thousands of years, and only in the last hundred years has it become a practical reality. And the U.S. is unique uh, in that it's, you know, half or a third the price here and much easier to do in the U.S. than any other country. So as long as people are here in the U.S. for whatever reason, you know, they're never going to be probably more than half an hour's drive or an hour's drive from a flight school. They're going to, you know, have the ability, just as an ordinary consumer with a credit card, to spend five or 10 hours mastering the basics of flying. So, you know, one thing that I tried to stress in the class is that, you know, they don't have to commit to getting an FAA pilot certificate, which means that you're safe to be the only pilot in the aircraft. You can go down to flight school, you can get your hands on the controls, and within five or 10 hours, learn to take off, fly around, land without the instructor having to touch anything or say anything. Uh, and that's doable for both airplanes and helicopters, just motivating people to you know, try to get up in the air and enjoy this unusual freedom that we have here in the U.S. I jumped in as part of the staff a year ago, and I spent about a month going through the PowerPoints to emphasize that this is an activity that can be done safely, especially with a, a two-pilot crew, you know, mm -hmm. maybe it's the instructor and, it's, and the student, or maybe it's a, a certificated pilot and uh, another friend who happens also to be a pilot. So I, I did that, and then some of it was just wording. People naturally <coughs> who are pilots, unfortunately, they'll tend to stress the hazards and how they avoided them. Mm -hmm. I think part of it is it makes them seem more impressive. So there were a lot of PowerPoints that says, well, you know, they had, they had the form of, you will die if you will do X. So I just edited them to say, you will be safe if you do not X. <laughs> right. <laughs> but it, it, was, it was still hard. You know, we had um, a guest lecturer who's an aerobatics instructor. And, okay. You know, he spent uh, some time talking about, you know, the hazards of mid-air collisions and how people avoid them. But, you know, if you look at the data, that's only 2% of accidents. It's, it's not a common way to have an accident at all. So, okay. you know, why, why scare people about it? Um, obviously, it's good to avoid any accident, but right. you know, he, didn't, he didn't share with the students. Look, I'm telling you about something that accounts for only 2% of accidents. Right. <laughs> They're sitting there terrified that, you know, they'll be flying along and all of a sudden somebody will smash into them. <laughs> Interesting. The course format has evolved from a weekly two-hour course taking place over an entire semester and turned into an intensive three-day program. This change has created more interest in the program and allowed more and more students to not only pass the FAA exam, which is the course's intended goal, but to go on and actually earn their private pilot certificate. So I got engaged in the course 16687, the private pilot ground school, 
in 2015. At the time, I was completing my doctorate at MIT. And as we continued to teach the course over time, we discussed the potential of changing the structure of the course. Mm -hmm. And last year was the first time we changed the structure of the course. So instead of being two-hour lectures in the evenings over the the full spring semester, it became the three-day intensive course. Mm -hmm. In the new learning format, I think the advantages are that the students can focus exclusively on this course for three days. So they're not distracted with other courses or um, other activities. They're just focused and living and breathing everything Mm -hmm. about becoming a pilot that's necessary. And I think that level of engagement has a different set of advantages. And so last year was the pilot of the new format, and it was very successful in many ways. We had about 101 students Uh, on the first day, and we completed the course with about 98 students. That was a big accomplishment, and we engaged a lot of the students, again, in terms of not only completing and passing the FAA exam, but continuing that enthusiasm and getting their their private pilot certificate. In my conversation with Philip and Tina, it became clear that there was something important about having this class meet in person. It seems like exactly the kind of content that might easily be converted to an online format, but there was something that made an in-person gathering not just useful, but essential here. So I asked them, why not just do this online? So MIT students are really good at reading books, and this material to pass the test you can self-study successfully. You know, people do that at commercial flight schools. They just go home, they read all the FAA books, which are available online in PDF. So, yes, you have to ask yourself, you know, what is the, what's the purpose of even having lecture halls in a university mm-hmm. when there's so much available online and when you have a population of people who are great readers? And reading is uh, three times faster than listening mm-hmm. in terms of, uh, you know, just being able to get through information. So that was part of why we said, well, look, we can do this in three days uh, because we're not going to try to cover everything um, and spoon feed it to people. They can read the books. So we'll ask them to do a little bit of pre-reading and then we'll inspire them, uh, we hope, with the in-person experience. And then they can go back to the books. Whereas I think the traditional class, you know, assumes that people don't have access to a lot of information outside of the course. I or if they or, or they have to be disguided with it will spoon feed you with a problem set or a reading assignment. Yes, absolutely. I would even say that less than half of the course was about the FAA knowledge exam. Mm-hmm. And the reason I would say that is that I think that so much more of the course was about becoming a pilot. Mm-hmm. A lot of the discussion and the interaction and the interactive discussions were really focused on decision making, which is very critical for a pilot. Just because you can answer a factual question about the weather, for example, doesn't necessarily mean you fully evaluated whether it is safe to fly, whether there are alternate options available how you go through that full decision-making process. Mm -hmm. We discussed everything from aircraft ownership, shared rentals, flying with friends, going on vacations, to really try to share with students how they could be empowered as a pilot. Mm -hmm. And we provided a lot of tips and insight from our own flying experience. For example, in the case of night flying, the idea of trying to take off before the sun has set so that you begin to acclimate to the night environment over time. Mm -hmm. These types of insights and experiences are not part of the FAA knowledge exam, but were some of the most important pieces of the course based on the student feedback we received. Mm -hmm. So it's really about what the students are interested in and engaged in. Mm -hmm. Throughout the three-day class, we also have a number of breaks. 
And at every single break, we would have students come up and either share an experience or ask a question or for clarification. And that type of feedback also helped us inform how we taught the class and how we connected different elements of the course together to help answer or provide some enlightenment on a particular topic and how it relates to other topics. One of the things I was most curious about was how Tina and Philip were able to bring over 100 students working at different paces through this material. These classes are often so full that there's a whole other overflow classroom to accommodate the numbers. What does it take to do that? One of the ways that we engage them is, you know, a traditional method of just asking a lot of questions. And we would call up students uh, to answer them. We had a very engaged group group of folks. Sometimes we would ask questions where we'd ask students to raise their hand to give us an answer, and sometimes we'd ask students to shout out an answer. Okay. A couple times we used some FAA practice exam questions, and we would have students um, kind of raise their hands whether they thought it was, you know, A, B, or C. And depending on how divided students were on the answer, uh, we knew whether we needed to spend more time on the topic or not. So, for example, one of the questions that we asked them was a real question from the FAA exam and a question that I got on my own FAA exam, which was about right of way when you're flying. Okay. So it was if you're flying and there is an aircraft refueling another aircraft, a glider, and a blimp, which has the right of way? Oh. And this was a really good question. Uh, it generated a lot of differences of opinion. We had basically a split uh, students uh, guessing all all three options. Hmm. So I'll. I'll leave that interesting question there uh, without the answer, so you'll have to view the course to find out. Yeah, I guess what, what I would add is that, you know, it was good to have, we had fairly frequent coffee breaks and a mm. pizza break, but a, a lot of it was, you know, the, the slide presentation to the students was really there to set the stage. Mm. And, you know, just having Tina there with a PhD in AeroAstro, that's way above and beyond, you know, what people would have available at a typical flight school mm-hmm. to really look at the engineering trade-offs instead of just saying, this is how it works, this is your, here's your Cessna, you know, it converged on this design sometime between the 30s and 40s. You know, one good thing about aviation is there's a huge amount of government-produced stuff. You know, the FAA has done, a, you know, a good to great job about making graphics available for, you know, every kind of aviation topic. Uh, So we mined a lot of this uh, public domain material from from the FAA. While having these materials accessible in the public domain can be a real boon to anyone teaching complex materials, it's rarely enough just to point to the resources and expect the knowledge to sink in. I wanted to know how these elaborate and math-intensive concepts were conveyed to students in a way that empowered them not only to pass the FAA knowledge test, but to be informed practicing pilots. To conclude our conversation, I asked Tina and Philip how they go about creating clear and useful instruction on complex topics, and they told me about a critical lesson in the class, weight and balance. For weight and balance, what you're talking about is you know, how you load the aircraft in terms of the fuel, the passengers, the baggage, and how that affects the flight. Mm-hmm. And so we used a physical model airplane to really demonstrate the effect on an airplane if your uh, center of gravity was too far aft. Uh, on the airplane. We also solicited um, input from the classroom regarding their weight and uh, weights of bags. We gave them some insights and tips that whenever they're flying to not necessarily trust what their passengers tell them is the weight, um, their own weight. So to be safety conscious, maybe apply a factor of safety on what your friends tell you that they weigh. And we used a book to show how you can do calculations And we also went live online to the website of certain flight schools to show how you can find the exact uh, 
gross weight and loading characteristics of different aircraft and different online calculators that calculate weight and balance for you and project that. Um, and then finally, we also showed how to do those calculations on an iPad with ForeFlight. So we showed, again, different ways to approach the same information and materials so that it wasn't just a, an academic description of how to calculate weight and balance, mm -hmm. but truly how they would do that as a pilot, not just the FAA regulations for it, but how they would go about doing that for a flight that they, they fly on. If you're interested in learning more about becoming a pilot, or just about the flight school itself, you can find the flight school materials on our website at ocw.mit.edu. And if you're an educator, check out our special portal on the site just for you at ocw.mit.edu slash educator. Thank you so much for listening, and if you like what you've heard so far, please consider subscribing and leaving us a review. Until next time, I'm Sarah Hansen from OCW.